thank you to everyone who joined and hello and happy new year to our alumni and friends of the University of Toronto Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering tuning in from near and far. From your registration information, we are delighted to see that we have alumni tuning in from all over the world. Today, we have alumni who have registered from eight different countries, including Canada, the USA, Azerbaijan, I actually looked at how to pronounce that, uh, China, Singapore, Malaysia, South Africa, and Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome to everyone. My name is Sonia DiBulio, and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations for the Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering. Thank you for joining us today for our January School Lunch and Learn presentation, presentation featuring Professor Joyce Poon from the Edward S. Rogers Senior Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Before starting, I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Just a quick housekeeping item, to please send your, your questions to our speaker today in the group chat section. We have staff who are pulling uh, together all your questions so they don't get lost, and we'll help our speaker get through as many as possible during the Q&A period, mm -hmm. which will be conducted at the end of the presentation. We will also, we've also pulled the questions that have been submitted through your um, registrations uh, and Joyce uh, will be looking after those as well. Professor Poon has kindly agreed to answer as many questions as possible as time permits. Now, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to pass the reins over to the chair of the School Lunch and Learn program, Lori Hevela. Lori is an Electrical 65 graduate and one of our most dedicated and engaged members of our alumni community. Lori has been chairing the School Lunch and Learn event for several years and continues to generously give his time to continue the tradition in this virtual event space. And with that, I will pass it over to Lori to welcome our speaker for today's event. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. As you pointed out, we're excited to have Professor Joyce Poon join us today. She will be giving her presentation entitled Trip the Light Fantastic. We have received a very enthusiastic response worldwide to today's presentation, and we are excited to have Professor Poon with us today to share her important research with us. As Sonia has pointed out, at the end of today's presentation, we will have time for questions and answers. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions during registration for this event. You are welcome to add additional questions to the group chat. And then at the end of Joyce's presentation, we will ask her to answer as many as possible. Joyce Poon is a director of the Max Planck Institute of Microstructure Physics. As Sonia pointed out, a professor of electrical and computer engineering here at U of T and an honorary professor in the Faculty of Electrical Engineering and computer science at the Technical University of Berlin. She and her team specialize in integrated photonics on silicon. She received her PhD and Master of Science degrees in electrical engineering from Caltech in 2007 and 2003 respectively, and her BASC in engineering science from U of T in 2002. She has received many recognitions over the years, including a Canada Research Chair in 2012, 2017, the ECE Department Teaching Award in 2017, Optical Fiber Communications Conference and Exposition Top Scored Paper in 2017, the McCharles Prize for Early Research Career Distinction in 2013. In 2012, she was named MIT's Top 35 Innovators Under 35. In 2010 and 2011, she received the IBM Faculty Award, and she is, of course, a Fellow of the Optical Society. And without further ado, Joyce, we turn it over to you. Thank you for being with us today, all the way from Germany. Thank you, Joyce, and welcome. 
So, uh, good afternoon to all of you, um, and thank you so much uh, for the Alumni Association for inviting me. Um, uh, I'm also an alumna, uh, alumna myself uh, from NSI. And uh, yes, yeah, and today I join you all uh, from my apartment uh, in Germany where I am doing my home quarantine. Uh, so I like to take you on a very exciting and interesting uh, journey um, about my research and also some really new um, possibilities and collaboration opportunities uh, at U of T that's coming up. So uh, yeah, let's have some fun. Yeah, trick the light, fantastic. So in, uh, as many of you know, um, Actually, fiber optic communication is the backbone of the internet, and that's because light uh, is the highest bandwidth, uh, uh, highest capacity sort of uh, medium for carrying information. And so with that, then th this is how the internet has come to be with the backbone made up of fiber optic networks that with light carrying information uh, around the world. So I can join you from Germany just like this, which is completely amazing. Um, and because of the information carrying capacity of light, uh, we are now finding fiber optic communication being brought into, for example, data centers, supercomputers, where the communication distances are much shorter, a few meters um, at, at most. And then uh, there's also a lot of research in terms of thinking about how to put uh, light or use optical communication between uh, microchips. And with that, you know, with more and more optical communication, we need more and more optical components. And the challenge is that uh, for a long time, photonics um, really involved making devices uh, in a very artisanal way. We use a lot of different materials, um, some of them very exotic, and the assembly methods could sometimes appear to be quite crude. Um, but in the past 15 years or so, uh, the field has really rapidly evolved, uh, the field of integrated photonics. And what has emerged is this technology called foundry silicon photonics. And the idea here is to use CMOS manufacturing um, uh, infrastructure, so the silicon foundries for producing electronic circuits, to make photonic uh, chips instead, using the same technology flow. Um, and so leveraging this huge investment that has been made in electronics, we can now make uh, optical components and make photonic components. And this can be now made on, on very large wafers. Um, there can be very dense integration possible. And this has greatly um, sort of changed the field and has very quickly evolved into a billion dollar industry with major uh, commercial uh, players in the field, including uh, Intel, for example. And so some examples uh, for my group, uh, for my group that in, in this area, we've worked in silicon photonics for at U of T for a number of years, and we've demonstrated with uh, collaborators at U of T, Professor Vanagesu, for example, um, very high-speed uh, electro-optic transmitters um, for data communication. Uh, with Professor Hoi Kwang Lo, we have demonstrated quantum uh, key distribution transmitters, so for quantum information, quantum encryption. Um, with um, uh, industry sponsors, we have demonstrated um, components and photonic circuits for very large scale optical switching. Uh, and uh, currently at U of T, we're collaborating with a French startup company called Sintel Photonics, which is a spin off from the National Lab Cialetti, which we were collaborating with before, uh, to commercialize a laser and modulator integration uh, with compound semiconductors, indium phosphide bonded. Uh, onto silicon. So there's a lot of commercial activity. Um, it's a very exciting field um, and also uh, uh, rapidly uh, changing the landscape of data communication. Um, a specialty in my group um, is actually the uh, integration of multi-layer uh, of waveguides onto, onto silicon um, uh, uh, waveguide level. So conventional silicon photonics only has one waveguide level with light being guided in silicon. And through a number of years of research and close collaboration with um, uh, ASTAR Institute of Microelectronics in Singapore, which then spun out <laughs> um, Advanced Micro Foundry again in Singapore, we explored um, uh, integration multi-levels of waveguides, which you can see here in a cross section. Um, and by working with uh, AMF, uh, we uh, can realize our ideas on eight-inch uh, diameter wafers on large-scale wafers uh, and in a foundry process. And now this type of technology can also be found at other foundries um, around the world, in Europe and in the US. 
So, so this is um, very interesting, um, and this has this is the the story in the integrated photonics world. The past 15 years or so, uh, with the foundry silicon photonics really uh, changing uh, the the economics of uh, of the of the photonic kind of component uh, industry. And then in this parallel universe, which is also very interesting, I'd like to share with you, um, is that in the field of neuroscience and neurobiology, the neurobiologists are now able to, in fact, map uh, brain circuits and brain activity with light. And this also, this sort of development also happened in the past 15 years or so. And what has been done over there is that the neurobiologists can genetically modify neurons so that the neurons can respond to light or can emit light when there's activity. So you could, because the neurons can be genetically modified so that they can, for example, emit light when they're, when they're firing, the biologists can now watch videos and just look at neural activity um, in, in even three dimensions. So you know, 2D and 3D if you scan in depth. So this is an example video where when the neurons fire, you actually see some blinking. Um, and then in terms of the control uh, of neurons, so when neurons can respond uh, to light, you can actually control neural activity with light. And this is a field called optogenetics. Um, and it uh, came out of uh, uh, Carl Dyseroth's lab uh, in Stanford in 2008. Uh, and uh, so here you see a mouse and its brain. Uh, some of its neurons have been genetically modified so that when uh, you shine blue light uh, into that brain region, those neurons would fire uh, more, more rapidly. Um, and then that will lead to a change in behavior. So here this mouse uh, has a fiber optic uh, uh, implanted into its head. Um, it looks a bit strange, um, but, uh, but this is how the biologists are doing experiments now. So in this video, um, uh, one of the first demonstration of uh, optogenetic control of neurons, uh, what you'll find is that initially, uh, so this mouse has a fiber uh, in his head, but the fiber is so thin you can't really see it. Um, and the and uh, initially the light is off, um, and so the mouse will walk somewhat randomly in this box. And then at some point the light turns on, and then the mouse will only run counterclockwise. So, so let's see. So in the beginning, it's just sort of exploring its box, and then the light has turned on, and it will run only counterclockwise. And in fact, this video goes on and on. When you turn the light off, then uh, then this mouse uh, um, again just uh, randomly explores its box. So, um, so it's, it's, it's very um, uh, interesting and definitely very uh, exciting possibilities to be able to, in fact, control neurons with light. So, uh, so you can watch neurons, you can control neurons. So, putting these two pieces together, um, the the neuroscientists are now using. Uh, optical technologies using light uh, in order to study brain circuits. So, um, and, and if there's interest, I can e explain a little bit more detail why this is um, so unique compared to, say, just using electrical stimulation um, and maybe other forms of um, soliciting uh, neuroactivity. But this is um, the genetic uh, manipulation uh, coupled with um, uh, the optical technology together, it's a very new tool for the neuroscientists to precisely um, uh, study brain circuits. But the neuroscientists, they, they, um, when they do these experiments, they work with very large microscopes, and they also uh, would just buy these parts um, that they put together and then um, put it into a mouse. And, and then, of course, uh, from myself and my group, we come from an integration uh, world, microchip world, and we can see the possibility of using our expertise and knowledge of integrated photonics to really, um, again, advance the, the field of uh, neuroscience and, and sort of bring forth brand new tools to study the brain and to brand new tools to interface with the brain with, a, with uh, being able to do high degree of integration and also um, putting multiple uh, modality of control and sensing all together. So this is a, um, a picture, a cartoon of sort of a concept of what we uh, could imagine making. Uh, so a microchip in which we have these um, needles that are, these are shanks that are implanted uh, into a brain of, of, of this small animal, of a mouse. Uh, along these shanks, uh, we can create waveguides and creating devices, optical devices that can shine light 
uh, out to excite neurons. We can collect light. There could be electrodes on the shank um, to measure electrical activity um, and so on. And uh, there will have to be integration of electronics, uh, input output coupling, etc. Um, and these types of integrated neurophotonic probes can then enable very high resolution and parallel uh, into interrogation and recording of neural activity. And by putting both optical sensors, you know, electrical sensors, chemical sensors all together, we can also do multimodal interrogation. Um, and of course, uh, coming from the from the world of micro, uh, almost data uh, data communication um, uh, and so on, that manufacturability is very important. And being able to use uh, foundry manufacturing to realize these microchips, in our view, is extremely important because it's the only way to achieve the complexity needed and also the volume, the parts needed to uh, for broad dissemination in the neuroscience community. So um, working again with AMF uh, for the last uh, few years, we have developed the processes to make neurophotonic probes on 8-inch uh, wafers using uh, deep UV uh, lithography. Um, and this is an example of a, of a probe wafer, and you could get uh, 1,600, some 1,800 probes on a single wafer. Uh, here are some images of these neural probes. They are super tiny. Um, in fact, uh, some scanning electron microscope of the gratings. Uh, we also have a way of um, addressing uh, the probe and you can shine light, get light out of a very specific location um, here along the shanks. Then um, in collaboration uh, with uh, Michael Rukas's group at Caltech and also Tofik Valiente's uh, group at the Crumble Brain Institute, which is, which is affiliated or right next door to um, Toronto Western Hospital, uh, we have been testing um, uh, these neural probes on tissues and in mice, mice to neural tissue and also in live mice. Um, and in this example, this uh, neural probe um, is a very interesting one. It's one um, that can achieve steering of light beams, even though there are no moving parts in the tissue at all. And the way it um, achieves this is to um, is to uh, use is to uh, use uh, optical phase arrays that are realized on the on the shank. So they're they're phase arrays uh, along the shank, um, and number of phase arrays here, and they uh, the interference out of the light emitters in this phase array. Uh, could uh, would, would change the, in the far field will change the beam pattern according to the wavelength. So this uh, uh, in this experiment, the uh, the brain tissue um, from the mouse that has the optogenetic um, the opsin expressed in the neurons, um, very specific type of neuron. Um, uh, this uh, neural tissue has been placed on an electrode array, so we can also record the electrical activity to validate the optogenetic activation. And this probe is inserted into the tissue, um, and the fluorescence image uh, from the tissue shows that, of course, as you change the uh, wavelength, then the beam pattern can steer around. Um, and then uh, down here, we can show that uh, when the light beams are on, that we do have uh, increased spiking activity, spike rate um, that's detected on the electrode array. So proving that this type of probe can deliver the power to uh, actually um, have uh, optogenetic uh, activation of the neural activity. So there are so many more experiments, but I, I just sort of want to highlight uh, some of these results. Um, and then another uh, uh, probe that we have demonstrated, um, again, in close collaboration uh, with Michael Rukas' group at Caltech and uh, Tofik Valiente's uh, group and Andres Lozano's group uh, at UHN, a Crumble Brain Institute, is a light sheet imaging probe. So here the, um, the neural probe uh, um, consists uh, of the shanks, and then we um, form a thin sheet uh, of light uh, using multiple gratings on, on multiple shanks. And so these gratings are specially designed to form a, a fairly uniform uh, plane of light, um, a, a, ten, a few, maybe 50 to 100 microns away from the surface of the shank. And then by having such a probe and then forming this light sheet um, emitting out of the probe, we can look from the top and then go through, for example, a few planes uh, of these light sheet and then and then image from the top. And this allows for volumetric uh, imaging uh, using uh, such a light sheet uh, probe. Um, and this is uh, quite exciting because typically light sheet microscopy with um, with a standalone microscope, a uh, conventional microscope, um, because of the lenses that you need to use to form a light sheet, 
um, it is actually very difficult to image non-transparent organisms. So you can only image some zebrafish larvae and some, but you couldn't you couldn't image a mouse um, uh, with with the um, with the lenses that are involved. But here we don't need a lens to form a light sheet, and so the probe just goes right in, and so we can image uh, a mouse, which is um, uh, quite interesting or quite a breakthrough. Uh, so here are images uh, in the fluorescent uh, fluorescing solution of the light sheet, um, showing that in this region uh, here that we have fairly uniform intensity, um, and um, there's also the side profile of the beam that you see uh, here, goes up and down. Um, and the validation experiments you can see here. So then we have the probe as attached to fiber, in fact, um, and then inserted into a mouse. Um, we've done experiments in fixed tissue, so this is tissue that is not live, in vitro uh, tissue, so tissue that is alive, um, and, and also in, uh, in live animal in vivo. Um, but some examples, so you can, um, the light sheet, again, there's enough power, optical power here to, um, to excite the, um, the, the tissue, and then you and then collect, the, then we can collect the fluorescence um, out. Um, in, in vitro, um, the a light sheet probe, you can see because it, there's only a one thin sheet of light excitation, there's a lot less background fluorescence, and so the contrast is much higher. You can see the neurons more, more clearly compared to epi fluorescence microscope. So exciting, the uh, sending excitation light from the top and also looking uh, from the top. And what we're working on these days is to uh, come up with miniature microscopes um, uh, inspired by the work at UCLA uh, to these mini scopes, but um, that, that are wearable by the, by the mouse. So you can um, do live uh, freely moving uh, behavior experiments, but we would want to um, uh, integrate uh, the neurophotonic probes uh, into such a housing. And, and that's work uh, that's underway. Um, so a few years ago, um, in 2018, uh, I was appointed uh, director at the, uh, at the Max Planck Institute of Microstructure Physics, um, and I took the position as my primary appointment in 2019. Um, so right now my appointment at U of T uh, is a part-time one, and I'll explain a little bit more in a moment <laughs> how, how that all works. Um, but in, in, um, in my uh, institute and in my new department at the uh, MPI for Microstructure Physics, um, uh, my department's called Nanophotonics Integration Neurotechnology. Uh, we are trying to create devices and microsystems to power future computers. And I put computers in quote because I think computers are much more than just our laptop and our cell phones. Um, I think that in the future, computers uh, will interface directly with the brain. And so this is where, um, where we are heading. Um, and uh, the core technology that we will build on is, our, is the visible light integrated photonic technology. Um, and uh, we are working on many types of neurophotonic probes um, uh, and also using that technology to realize uh, photonic circuits for micro displays, a little bit less invasive, a much more ECE style. I'm also working on photonic hardware accelerators. Uh, so, um, since there are uh, maybe many of you are not so familiar with the Max Planck Society, and it is actually extremely unusual for an engineer to get into the Max Planck Society, um, I thought I would spend a few minutes just describing the Max Planck Society and then sharing with you um, what my institute does, and then and also then presenting to you uh, the new opportunities that are coming up between Max Planck Society and U of T. Uh, so the Max Planck Society, Max Planck Gesellschaft uh, in Deutsch, in German, is an independent uh, research organization. It's primarily uh, funded by the government of Germany. It's a public institution. Um, there is not a single Max Planck Institute. So in fact, there are, as you can see, 91 or so Max Planck Institutes um, in total. Um, 86 of them are in Germany. Uh, the operating budget uh, every year is 1.8 billion euros, um, and it's, um, it's, an, it's a society that is very well known for basic scientific research. Uh, the founding president uh, is Max Planck, and the society was founded after World War II in 1948. His predecessor is um, the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, or society, sorry, um, and the, the the sort of the guiding principle of the Max Planck Society is that insight must precede application. The 
so as you can see here, I read here, the mission is to really deliver or to conduct cutting edge basic research, curiosity driven research. Um, the Max Planck Institutes, the directors and scientists, we have a lot of autonomy in, in our work um, because the base funding is extremely high um, and um, the focus is really on, on finding good people to do uh, good work and there's a lot of trust in the in the scientists and the directors that um, that the ideas could lead to something very interesting so it is um, not really about uh, finding uh, a, a sponsor to deliver um, a prototype in, in a couple of years so they take a very long-term view and give a lot of trust uh, to the scientists to explore there have been uh, 20 Nobel laureates uh, in the Max Planck Society. Uh, there were two last year, uh, one in chemistry and one in physics. Um, and um, as I conduct more research, as I get settled into Germany, I begin to realize why this is possible. Um, it's because of the very high level of funding um, and kind of unwavering support uh, that's available to conduct research at, um, at a very high level. And, and so the scientists don't have to lose confidence um, as they conduct the, their work. Um, so here is a map of showing all the uh, institutes around Germany. So as I said, there, there are 86, uh, there isn't a single Max Planck Institute, um, but, but there are actually uh, many of them. Um, and each institute has some area of focus. Um, and the Max Planck Society is um, not a university, so it actually cannot grant any academic degrees. Uh, but it does cooperate a lot with universities so that students can come to the, the to, to an institute do a research and then get the degrees uh, at at, the, at a university so uh, that's how the society works um, and the institutes uh, partner very much with with universities uh, locally and also around the world um, each uh, MPI uh, and each director has a his budget, his own budget, recruit staff, um, has a lot of freedom in selecting what to do. Um, and the society, in fact, is divided into three sections. The biology medicine is one, uh, chemistry, physics, technology is another one, so I belong to this one, and humanities and social sciences, which is a much smaller section. Uh, and U of T, in fact, has a very good, I would say, relation with the Muslim Society for a number of years because um, I'm certainly not the first a U of T professor to be a director at an MPI. Um, Dwayne Miller uh, from chemistry uh, was a director uh, uh, until 2020 at the MPI for the, 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 of the structure and dynamics of matter in Hamburg, and he just returned uh, to U of T. Uh, and Professor Saha is a director in Göttingen at the MPI uh, for the uh, study of religious and ethnic diversity. And she's a faculty uh, of, uh, she's a professor in the faculty of law at U of T. So um, because the uh, Max Planck directors are not um, professors by default, because the, uh, the um, MPIs are not universities, so that's why, in fact, U of T, uh, including myself, have actually been able to to work together with the Max Planck Society for uh, in this way, where we could, uh, where I could um, serve as a director at, at a research institute, and yet uh, retain um, an affiliation uh, with U of T as a professor, just like uh, Dwayne and also Ayelet. So let me tell you a little bit about my institute. Uh, it's located in the city of Halle, which is uh, in central Germany. Uh, we have we have an annual budget of about 15 million euros. Uh, the, the director um, right now um, consists of myself and Stuart uh, Parkin. I'm currently the managing director of the institute, um, and Stuart uh, stepped down from that role. Uh, and he is um, he comes from IBM Almaden, and he's uh, he's a material physicist by training, and he's in fact very famous uh, for his work. In, um, in materials for magnetic memory. He invented the materials that I used in hard drives. Um, so it's been a pleasure to, to get to know him and work with, uh, work with him also. Uh, we've also, we're in the final stages of recruiting a, um, a third director in material chemistry. Uh, and then very recently retired as a, again, a very acclaimed uh, theorist, Eva Hart Gross. And then here in my institute, I discovered uh, last year, also a very interesting connection it turns out that the external scientific members, so an honorary 
um, sort of member of the Max Planck Society at our institute is in fact Professor Sajeev John. Um, and Professor Sajeev John is a professor of physics at U of T. Uh, he specializes in optics. Um, he invented uh, photonic crystals. So what a coincidence. And, and I hope to invite uh, Sajeev back to institute uh, when travel is possible. Um, he hasn't been at the MPI uh, for about eight years, eight to 10 years. So he used to collaborate with the former director uh, at the Institute and, and uh, uh, but I, I did not know this uh, before. So it's hired completely separately and yet at the same time, the world is so small that it um, turns out that Professor John has been there a number of times and, and, have, and also other professors of, in physics department, in the physics department uh, um, are quite uh, familiar uh, with, uh, with my MPI. So um, next, I'd like to take you on a, on a short tour of my institute, um, and I'll play this uh, video, and I think it should work, so let's try. The Max Planck Institute for Microstructure Physics is really an entirely new institute that we have been rebuilding starting from four years ago. And the focus of this new institute is really on novel materials and physical phenomena that could enable us to build new technologies that can change the world. We want to have significant impact on society. My own department involves largely the atomic engineering of new materials, which we build one atomic layer on top of another atomic layer using advanced thin film deposition techniques. Our concept is we want to build new materials whose properties are influenced by flowing currents of spin polarized electrons or by flowing currents of ions. In this way, we can create new structures that would enable, for example, highly dense storage memory devices or potentially. Devices that can make the way we think in our brains. I am leading a new department called Nanophotonics Integration and Neurotechnology. In this department, we will be using our knowledge of integrated photonics to create new types of microchips and microsystems to advance neuroscience as well as create new types of computing devices for the future. And our objective is to have a highly dynamic institute and we welcome those who want to carry out a PhD, want to do a postdoc, who want to think differently and innovatively and laterally. So, um, so that, that was my uh, institute. Um, um, it's a uh, it's in a very nice setting right next to a river, um, and so that that that's real. But uh, the videos were taken in the in the sunnier part of the year, so in the summer, uh, about a couple of years ago. So um, at that time, I had just uh, taken up my uh, position um, as a so at that time the the directorship was a second secondary position, um, and my labs uh, were not ready. So uh, in uh, last year, uh, in the middle of last year, so then my labs uh, uh, in Germany uh, here uh, have become um, are starting to be more and more ready. Um, and here are some pictures of our uh, optics labs, um, the uh, clean room facility, and some biology uh, labs. Uh, our campus is also expanding at the MPI. So this is the current building. Uh, we are building a, um, an extension to a building here for the transmission electron microscopes and they'll be completed maybe in a month or so. There's also um, a new building, uh, a completely new scientific building to be completed in about five years, four or five years. Uh, this is the uh, picture of the transmission electron microscope uh, building. This TM building will house two new a brand new state-of-the-art uh, TEMs for studying uh, thin films. Uh, this is the foundation uh, um, for the building. Uh, it's completely isolated uh, from its environment. Um, so and the next uh, is this uh, sort of picture of the building uh, that's coming up. Uh, it'll be done uh, by 2025, hopefully. Uh, the budget is about 50 million euros, um, a very huge uh, monster of a building, uh, 11 thousand um, uh, more than 11,000 square meters of gross uh, area so um, but it's uh, very exciting to see the investment that Germany uh, places in, in in scientific research so 
Um, but of course, all of this um, excitement, um, a lot of building up, and this really different uh, research environment that um, I've now come into contact with is also benefiting a lot of U of T students. So this uh, picture is taken in the summer um, uh, last year, uh, and, and this is my this was uh, the group at the time in Germany, um, and all the people with the little circle around the head um, are or were U of T. Uh, students or postdocs at one point have come to Germany to uh, continue their work um, uh, and they, they're also outside not on this picture uh, also um, as you can see uh, eight other uh, um, uh, personnel co-workers that um, are U of T affiliated so um, this is very exciting uh, uh, opportunities for U of T uh, students and postdocs uh, to be able to go abroad and and because I have um, I'm familiar with now both sides it's also a very nice uh, transition for them. So it's not it's foreign, but also not so foreign. Um, and then I'm also very excited to announce that um, so in, in expanding and deepening the partnership between Moscow Society and the University of Toronto, um, that later this year we will be able to launch the Max Planck University of Toronto Center for Neuroscience and Technology. Um, and this center is a partnership between the Max Planck Society and U of T and represents significant investments by both sides. So the Max Planck Society will invest at least two and a half million euros over five years and U of T has matched also with 3.8 million Canadian dollars uh, in support of the center. Um, the center will focus on research for the, um, the neuroscience and neurotechnology uh, developing new tools to study the brain, to conduct uh, experiments in, in small animals and also in humans, and also to do analytic data analytics and modeling. Um, many organizations uh, are involved. The Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering is really the center, uh, uh, center uh, the, the champion of this, uh, of this center. And the, the, but the Faculty of Medicine, of course, involved and the university affiliated hospitals. The main feature of the center will be a joint PhD program where the first year uh, U of T student would be primarily U of T based to do um, uh, coursework and then in the later years the student can be a, in, in an MPI doing research and the student will be co-supervised uh, by U of T professor and a Max Planck uh, scientist uh, but graduates uh, at the end of the day with a U of T degree because here the Max Planck Society again does not grant any degree, so U of T students, a U of T student will have the opportunity to to go abroad, um, uh, get new experiences, um, visit and work in new labs, um, and yet uh, come back and also uh, have the Toronto experience. The leadership uh, of the center, U of T, are uh, is Professor uh, Tofi Valiente and Professor Dongping Feng. Um, and I also like to deeply acknowledge um, the support of Dean Chris Yip, uh, who was the Associate uh, uh, Vice President of International and uh, for and became the Dean of Engineering. He has been uh, really a, a champion um, and a great supporter of this effort over the last few years to make everything happen. Uh, definitely without him, uh, the center could not come to, to fruition. Um, I also like to acknowledge uh, the current Associate VP, International Alex Mihailidis, uh, for uh, trying to get everybody together and try to finalize this thing. So, so uh, I think we will have uh, the center launch uh, very, very soon, uh, which is at the very final stages of reaching an agreement uh, with the Max Planck Society. Um, so in closing, um, I've uh, shown you how uh, foundry fabrication for silicon photonics has, uh, well, is revolutionizing data communication, is a technology that's quickly maturing um, and providing low-cost um, ways of manufacturing fairly complex photonic circuits for um, data center communication um, and maybe eventually even shorter distance like chip-to-chip -chip communication. Uh, what my group has, is doing is to take our experience there to um, realize new types of, into, of, uh, of neurophotonic devices for brain recording and brain stimulation. Um, and there are now, of course, new opportunities to uh, work internationally um, towards making new types of uh, cognitive devices and systems. To, of course, thank all the people who do all the hard work, our collaborators and the students uh, and the postdocs uh, involved. In particular, I'd like to highlight the contributions of Wesley Satcher, who was a PhD student at U of T, 
Um, he did a postdoc elsewhere, now coming back uh, into the MPI to be a, a research group leader. Uh, he is really phenomenal and has done a lot of the work, uh, laying the foundations for a lot of the work that uh, I told you about today. So, so in closing, I'd like to, uh, so instead of Fred and Ginger, we can go to more, more modern times uh, that uh, for Mary Poppins return, that we could, you know, when life is getting a bit scary, then yeah, be your own luminary. So shine a light for all the world to see and trip a little light fantastic with me. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, at this point, we will open it up to questions. Uh, if you have not already done so, you can uh, submit a question in the chat box. Uh, we had one earlier during the course of the presentation, and the question was, can you comment on the use of neurophotonics technology in the research and or treatment of various forms of dementia? Hmm. Right. So, um, that is a, an area that is still under investigation. Um, I, I do know some uh, faculty members that are uh, working on, on this aspect. Um, uh, the brain is very complicated. No one really knows how, how it works. Um, but there are, um, there are some efforts um, in terms of thinking about shining um, at least infrared light or red light um, to maybe stimulate extra activity uh, in the brain so that uh, without any genetic modification, um, it's called photobiomodulation, uh, in, perhaps to improve the conditions um, associated with dementia. Um, and uh, we actually worked with a professor, uh, more Professor Andres Lozano, who was interested in uh, doing um, a deep brain stimulation uh, for Alzheimer's therapy, and but he wanted to understand the neural circuits, and so um, he was doing um, optogenetic experiments uh, with that. So it's still it's mis the brain is mysterious, and there's a lot of research. Uh, we have another question that just popped up to a slide that you showed in the very early part of your presentation. Do you know which parts of the brain to stimulate in order to get uh, in order to get the mouse to go clockwise or counterclockwise? Right. Yeah. So that's a, that's a great question. Actually, it's pretty it's really simple. So that's not a very sophisticated neuroscience experiment. So what uh, that what that experiment was was um the the right hand side motor the right half of the brain the motor cortex uh, had the genetically modified neurons. And so um, when the light is shown on the right side, the right side controls the left, right? So the, the right side motor cortex fired more, and so the left side runs a little bit faster compared to the right-hand side, and so then the mouse steers left. So if they uh, excited the, 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 the left <laughs> motor cortex, which controls the right side, then it will go, it will go clockwise. The mouse would run clockwise. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from a former classmate of mine. Do you have a goal of your research or are you just experimenting to see where it all takes you? Um, yeah, I do have uh, some goals um, I, because in engineering, it's hard to go without a goal. Um, uh, so my, my goal, um, I do have very specific goals in, in terms of uh, different technology that we want to achieve. So I won't maybe get into too many technical details uh, there, but the, the photonic technology that we, um, we are coming up with to make the neural probes, um, there's a lot of design um, that has to happen, a lot of, yeah, a lot of heavy lifting work. And so there, there, there's definitely a very specific milestones of what we want to achieve. Um, maybe a lot slightly longer term, uh, it will be, um, I would, I'm very much looking forward to maybe getting to a stage where we really can have these neural technology um, disseminated out to, to the neuroscience community and to enable very com much more complex uh, neuroscience experiments uh, than what can be done today. Uh, again, there's just a lot of, um, there's a lot of work that has to be done. Um, uh, we can always come up with new um, designs and maybe new ways of generating light and so on. But but there's also a lot of um, really technical challenges, like how, how to bring the fiber to this chip. Um, where does you, 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 how about the heating? Um, 
for neuroscientists to use the, the chip easily. We need to have uh, connectors. Uh, we need to have back-end electronics. We need to have easy-to-use computer interfaces. There, there are lots of these details. So, um, so that's uh, so. My goal would be one day for the neurotech that it is actually practical and can be used. Um, and um, so we we experimenting, but I I, I do. Um, I feel that I do have quite confident um, a vision of where where I would like to to go. Uh, we have another question that's just been posted. You mentioned that one of the applications of this technology was integrating our brain with computers, cell phone processors. Does that mean we can think about something and say Google can open up a search page about what you are thinking? Um, yeah, that would be that would be a start. Um, but later on, we can also imagine um, some neuroprosthetics. So the question about dementia, uh, what if it was just um, some part, uh, some there's some malfunction circuits? Um, could we then um, replace it, <laughs> or maybe at least assist it uh, with with an implant? Um, I mean, there, there are many ethical questions uh, involved now. Um, uh, we don't, I don't, yeah, I'm not so comfortable getting into it, but you can imagine you could, well, what if you, you, you have this chip and now you have more memory or um, can become smarter, uh, learn a new language, um, et cetera. So um, who knows where that would go um, like 100 years from now. Uh, while we wait for more online questions, let me go to some that were submitted during the registration process prior to the presentation. The first question is a general question. What is the ultimate objective of your research on brain neural networks? Um, so the, the objective will be, um, so here, yeah, I, I, maybe after the talk, I, uh, we, we can understand that, um, so I do a lot of technology, um, like come out new new technology to enable the, the neuroscience uh, work. Um, it would be, um, so one sort of uh, um, goal, exper experimental goal we're trying to achieve, but it doesn't really have uh, obvious application, is to, um, if we could uh, have a precise way of stimulating the brain, recording the brain, um, and very high resolution with doing that. Uh, we we would want to do some. We want to be able to do modeling on the data to kind of understand, decode what it means, and then um, then also interface. Then we then we'll be able to interface it with, um, say, like an FPGA with an electronics board. So we can then create um, some um, uh, hybrid uh, system of electronics uh, plus um, this brain tissue. Um, and maybe that's a kind of uh, AI, uh, artificial intelligence that's much more energy efficient, can learn, can adapt uh, much more easily, um, but it's also part organic. So um, anyway, so that's something that uh, we're thinking about uh, also to explore. But the longer term goal for at least the neurotech, um, at least a, a big driver for, for, for me would be to, um, to be able to uh, provide uh, really new techniques, enable new techniques in the field of neuroscience. Uh, we have another question that was posted online. If the government is funding this research, which as we understand the German government is, and makes this chip mandatory, does that mean the government can control how we behave? Interesting question in this day and age. Right. Um, uh, well, it depends on what happens um, uh, in the future. Um, I think it, it's really uh, difficult to control overall uh, behavior. The brain is very complex, and there are many uh, uh, circuits that, that are sort of um, really resilient. So there, there's a lot of redundancy uh, in the in the brain as well. So I I don't I don't think. It's so simple as if there's a chip, um, a small chip that it would, um, it will immediately lose uh, everything um, about yourself. So um, that will, that will take many, many, many more um, a centuries, I think, uh, of work. 
Uh, we had another follow-up question. To what degree does the mouse have control of its own body after generic brain modification and the chip implant? Yeah, so the, yeah, that's a great question. So um, the uh, genetic uh, modification and the implant, uh, once is in, uh, when they, and the implant's not on, uh, the mouse would appear to be unchanged. So the control experiments um, have shown that uh, this uh, genetic modification, uh, the, the, the ones that are being done, um, and more specifically to make neurons kind of react to light and respond to light is, um, is to put uh, light sensitive uh, proteins, like sensitive ion channels on the cell membrane of neuron mem uh, cell membrane, and um, and that does not appear to affect uh, the overall uh, behavior or the health of the animal. Uh, I'll return to the question submitted in advance. This is not a technical question. You're not a investment manager, but the question is: Could you suggest some companies that will benefit from this technology? and in which we could invest. <laughs> I know you're not here to provide investment advice. No, I, I don't, I cannot comment on, on companies, but uh, the field of neurotech is growing very fast. Um, maybe the most public one that uh, you might see today in the media would be the one by Elon Musk. Um, does Neuralink, uh, just electrical recordings, uh, yeah, so, so um, he probably doesn't need any more investments. Maybe my own startup, uh, yeah, my startup in the future, I think would be a worthy investment. Okay, we have uh, another question. Uh, have you done any work with Jeff Hinton? Um, I have not worked with Jeff. Uh, he has retired. We exchanged emails, but uh, he, he, is, uh, he has retired. So no, I have not. Okay, we have another somewhat related question. Will you choose carefully your research direction only based on ethical projects? Will you consider collaborating with the humanity group, whatever that is, on learning what aspects of your research will lead to ethical or unethical applications? Yeah, I think, of course, uh, scientists, uh, no matter what we do, whether it's um, so neurotech, of course, you know, the, 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 the idea of ethics comes to mind immediately. But even when we talk about data communication, quantum information, um, any, any work uh, that I've come across, any work that any engineer could do, of course, we face, we have to make sure that we, we, we work on ethical projects and we hold a very high standard. Um, I think that's why we took the iron ring oath. So yes, <laughs> we, <laughs> I work on, yeah, I only work on ethical projects. Um, uh, we have another question. Do you see any application of this technology towards artificial intelligence? And if yes, how? Um, yeah, that's a, a good question. I do. Um, and. And I see some problems with uh, AI now. So um, AI is uh, machine learning and so on, um, as we see it today, is very power uh, hungry. And it's um, still a long ways away from biological intelligence. So um, the amount of data that you, um, uh, oh, someone said stop sharing my screen. So um, the, the amount of um, uh, data that's required to train neural networks and to, um, uh, to, to actually train these uh, yeah, networks to operate, it, it, it just um, not, not, that's not how biological intelligence works. These, the, the algorithms that are proposed are kind of biomimicking, but, but they, the, the brain doesn't have like back propagation, like that's not what it does. So, um, so I think there's still a lot of opportunity to to um, to do something different and propose new maybe approaches. And I I think that um, uh, one so as I mentioned, so maybe perhaps uh, one way of having a new kind uh, of AI or brain mimicking tech could be um, maybe part like actually part organoid, so part live uh, brain tissue 
uh, coupled with, uh, with the hardware, like the electronics, um, or maybe these chips that have um, multimodal control of the brain. So that's a new form of computing. There could also be, I mean, a little bit more near term, could also be uh, new types of um, electronic and also um, optical or magnetic, you know, whatever it would be. Uh, microchips that does so-called neuromorphic computing. So, so we we, we will redesign uh, the computer architecture so that uh, computing um, it's a little bit more mimicking uh, uh, again uh, brain like the biological brain. So that will be AI, AI, but not AI as we uh, see it today. And now uh, the last question is what you are doing with optics similar to what has already been done with pure electrical probes? So, yeah, the difference is that the, um, uh, with the electrical probes, so um, you can also you can buy them very easily now. Uh, with doing electrophysiology, there is no specificity in, in, the, in the neurons that you could probe. So, if you, if you put the electrode into the brain, you just pick up all electrical signals coming from all neurons, um, and it is just a very, like you, you see a lot of things going, lot, lots of signals going on, lots of, almost looks like almost noise. And it takes um, a lot of effort to sort of tease things out, to do sorting of the data, to sort of guess, so, so what neurons are, are, were there, how many were there, um, where could they have been? So, so that's the um, electrophysiology work uh, today. Um, or that's the limitation of, uh, or the function of the electro, electrical probes, electrophys. Um, with optics, because the, the, the neurons were genetically modified to express these light sensitive uh, proteins, you have that uh, genetic control over very specific types of neurons that, um, are, that you could be um, uh, probing or, or measuring at the time. And that, again, is an incredibly powerful tool. So when you stimulate, I would like you know you're only stimulating maybe interneurons or pyramidal neurons. You're not you're not stimulating all of them. Uh, very only very specific um, types. Um, and uh, with the imaging, then you you could in fact see the neurons. So you, there's no question like which neurons uh, are firing um, because you, you just see them. So so this is the um, this is the huge difference uh, between uh, optical techniques and the electro. Uh, physiology uh, uh, techniques. So optics is much newer, um, and uh, but also uh, very much a revolutionary way of studying the brain um, in, in that in that field. Thank you, Joyce. We are approaching the top of the hour, so in closing, I would like to thank everybody that has joined us today for all of your questions. Uh, before we close, obviously, we need to thank Professor Poon for being with us today, as she said, all the way from Germany. We invite those of you that joined us today to provide your feedback on the School Lunch and Learn program. A link to the online survey was made available in the chat and will be shared with you after this event. And in response to some of the questions in the chat, a link to the presentation will be shared with all registered guests early next next week that will allow you to go to our uh, YouTube channel in, view, in order to view the presentation again. School Lunch and Learn are typically held on the second Wednesday of each month. Uh, and thus, our next meeting will be on Wednesday, February 10th. At this event, our featured speaker will be Professor Tim Bender from the Department of Chemical Engineering and Applied Chemistry, who will be speaking about the U of T Sustainability Lab, Accelerating Environmental Research and Education. We obviously need to thank our sponsors, MBNA, uh, who are sponsors of School Lunch and Learn through U of T's Spill Pillar uh, sponsorship program. If you're interested in learning more about School Lunch and Learn, you can either go to the School Lunch and Learn website or send an email to the alumni office at events at engineering.utoronto.ca. In closing, I would like to thank you again for joining us for today's meeting and hereby adjourn today's session of School Lunch and Learn. Please have a safe 
and healthy day. Thank you, everybody.